Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ron Pressler. I work at Oracle here in London uh, as part of the uh, Java Platform Group. That's the group that develops OpenJDK, designs the Java language, the JVM, and the core libraries. Uh, and I serve as the technical lead for Project Loom. That is the project uh, that's uh, intended to add continuations and fibers to the JDK. Now, uh, this talk is not part of the Java track. It's part of the programming languages track. So I've been asked to make it more uh, theoretical. And uh, we're going to start with quite a bit of theory. Things are going to get more concrete later on. Uh, but this gives me an opportunity to speak about and to focus on subjects, aspects of the project that I don't normally get to talk about. Uh, but if you are more interested in the more down-to-earth aspects of the project, then you can uh, search for other Loom Talks on uh, YouTube. Now, as I've said, I work for Oracle, so I'm required to show you this slide that basically says that everything I'm about to tell you is a lie. Brilliant. Okay, so um, our views of computation have changed based on what we use computation for. Uh, traditionally, or in the past, we used to think of computation as being deterministic. Uh, so what we see here, the circles, we can think of them as program states. And on the left, we have deterministic computation. We don't know in which state we start the program because you can think of it as different command line arguments. But once we do, there's uh, only one outgoing edge for each state. So once we start, we know where we're going to end up. And this view uh, sees computation as sort of a function. You have an input and you get an output. Uh, in the last few decades, we've been using computation more and more in interactive systems. And such systems are non-deterministic, and if we're at any point in the program, the next state uh, could possibly be more than one. And uh, one of the reasons for that is interaction, or IO. That's the one I'm, I'm mainly uh, going to be talking about. So for example, if you want to read an input from the user or read something from a socket, you don't know what it's going to be, so you don't know what the next program state is going to be. Other sources of non-determinism can be uh, concurrency or threading. Right? So if you let the kernel scheduler decide which thread to schedule on the CPU, uh, you don't know, as a programmer, which one it's going to be. So the next program state can be one of many possible ones. So we're going to start with uh, to talk about uh, how different languages uh, do I.O. Um, and we're going to start with a paradigm that is perhaps the most closely associated with the deterministic view of programming, that is pure functional programming. Uh, and in this paradigm, uh, a language term, a, like a subroutine application, uh, behaves similarly to a, a function application in maths. Um, you have, for any given value of input, uh, you necessarily get uh, only one, always the same, uh, output. So the question is, um, how do we describe non-deterministic programs? And we said non-determinism is something that's uh, uh, forced on us by virtue of being interactive in such a world. Um, so we can think of non-determinism, instead of uh, saying uh, the next thing I'm going to do is either this or that, uh, we can imagine that there is an additional parameter um, that we don't know what it is, and uh, that additional parameter really determines our next step. So things are sequential and deterministic, but in this way we can model non-determinism. Uh, so if you think about it, I can toss a coin, and uh, from my perspective, the result is going to be completely non-deterministic, but it may well be that the universe is very much deterministic, and the reason I don't know the result of the coin toss is because I don't have... Uh, all the, all the uh, uh, known parameters, uh, but the universe does. So I can think that uh, the outcome of the coin toss is actually a, a deterministic function of some value that I don't know. So we transform this picture on the left to the picture on the right by adding more parameters. So the language perhaps most associated with its style is Haskell, and what you see here is not Haskell. It's a, a language that I made up for the purpose of these slides. Uh, but it's very, very similar to Haskell. And we're going to try to express non-determinism in this way. So we have some IO subroutines, get line and put string line. And uh, they're going to take this hidden 
mysterious parameter called world that is not known to us, but represents the state of the universe. And um, these subroutines are going to consume it and give me a new value of world and perhaps do something else. So get line is going to also return a string, what reads from the console, and put string line is going to output that string. And uh, in that language, uh, the main program uh, just takes the state of the world, returns a new state of the world. And uh, I've used uh, a construct that does not exist in Haskell, I think, uh, let prec, just to, so I can reuse a W variable. Uh, but I get the world from main. Uh, then I pass it to get line, get a new world and the result string. And then I pass the world to put string line uh, with a string, it outputs it to the console, and I'm done. Um, to see what's going on here more closely without reusing the same variable. Uh, so at each of those steps, I get a new value of the world. So we start with w0, we use that, we get w1 back, we use that, and we get w2. Um, the problem with that is that uh, this is insufficient. And uh, in fact, uh, it won't work to uh, represent IO for the following reason. Every time we read a line from the user, we don't know what the next stage is going to be. We don't know what the result is going to be. But uh, from what I presented you, I'm allowed to pass the same value of the world, W0, to get line twice. And according to this model, I would need to get the same value again uh, uh, in both cases. But this is not the case because the user is allowed to enter whatever string they want. But we can solve this by adding something called linear types, which are represented here with the upside down exclamation mark. And uh, if I say that the world value is a linear type, then the compiler is going to ensure that I use each of those values exactly once. So if I pass w0 to get line and I get w1 back and I try to pass w0 again, uh, the compiler is going to give me an error that w0 has already been consumed. And if uh, we make sure that each of these mysterious parameter, world parameters, only used exactly once, uh, we can actually uh, represent non-determinism in this fashion, and this is how the results tend to look like. Uh, I think there are some languages that do that already, if you've heard of Cogent. Uh, maybe uh, Idris is playing with that a bit, uh, but this is not what Haskell does. There is another solution, and if you remember the beginning, I showed you that even in the deterministic picture of the world, uh, there is one point of allowed non-determinism, and that is the beginning of the program. Okay, so we're allowed to begin the program in one of various states, but once we start, we are deterministic. So what we can do is to uh, move the non-determinism outside of the program and say, okay, the transition from A to B is deterministic, and now we want to ask for input. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically end the program, return back to the runtime, uh, ask the runtime to read some input for us, and then restart the program at a new entry point, depending on what the user has inserted. And this is exactly what Haskell does. So this is actual Haskell now. Um, and this code doesn't show you much. It actually looks quite imperative. But this is just syntax sugar for the following. The main function returns a value of uh, something called an IO type. And that value is constructed uh, with a function called bind IO. And bind IO constructs a value of the IO type from a pair of two things. First, the operation we want the runtime to perform. And second, the new program entry point. And what we do here, we basically say, OK, this program is done. I've returned the runtime this pair. Uh, but then the runtime is going to ask the user for input and going to start the program again passing that string of input into the new entry point. Uh, there is actually a bit more going on here to make this kind of programming uh, actually convenient and nice to use. Uh, these IO values can be combined in a nice pattern with these two functions, return IO and bind IO, and that's called uh, a monad. So the I is a monad. Uh, it is quite problematic, even in a language like Haskell, but we're not going to talk too much about uh, the problems of monads. Um, but uh, just to say that uh, what monad does is it allows us to combine various operations uh, on the IO type in a nice way, and that is what enables us to use this nice uh, do notation with nice syntax. Uh, 
But if you're not using Haskell, uh, if you're using classical imperative programming like Java or C or Python, uh, in those languages, uh, the meaning of an operation uh, such as uh, a subroutine application uh, is not the same as a mass function. Uh, if you're interested in programming language theory, you may know this. It's, uh, it's something that's uh, called a predicate transformer. It doesn't really matter. What matters here is that uh, the outcome of this operation does not need to be deterministic, unlike functions. And this is why, uh, in Java, we can write code that looks like this. Uh, we just uh, read line, and we are non-deterministic. We don't know what the result in string is going to be. And then we print it uh, right back out to the console. So um, this is why it's surprising. So in languages like this, uh, uh, dealing with non-determinism is quite easy, and it's built into uh, the, the semantics of the language. But this is why it's surprising that we find the following. In the Java core libraries, we see this uh, strange class, completable future. And I've translated the signature of the uh, methods to uh, Haskell-like notation. And if you look at that, uh, those signatures are actually identical to those we find with the return I.O. and bind I.O. And that is because uh, this class actually implements a monad. And there are various uses for monads, but this class is used to do I.O. And the question is why? Uh, we know why we need it in Haskell, because Haskell is deterministic and functional, uh, but Java isn't. So why do we need to use a monad in Java to do I.O.? So there is something else going on here. Um, it's not just a non-determinism, uh, and it's not just the theory. The part of the code that performs certain kinds of computation are actually run on the CPU. But when we want to do I.O., we need to move off the CPU and use different circuitry in the computer. And we basically need to uh, release the CPU to do other stuff, and we call that blocking. So what readline does, it also blocks. It stops using the CPU. It asks the operating system to do I.O. for us using other circuitry in the machine. And when it's done, we ask the uh, operating system to bring us back to the CPU. And we've all learned, and, and, and this is done uh, using processors or threads. And we've all learned uh, back in kindergarten that blocking threads is bad because threads are big and heavyweight and expensive, and you can only have so many of them, and blocking is slow, so we shouldn't do that. So it's not because of the semantics or the meaning of the language that uh, we use that strange monad, but because we just don't want to block. So we're using a similar mechanism taken from a completely different paradigm to solve a different problem. Um, and um, that, right, so, um, so let's look at this Java method that does some, uh, important computation, and it uses microservices. So every time I call compute, I actually go over the network, I pass some operation I want my computing service to do, financial computing service to do, and uh, I'm going to block, and when it's done, I'm going to get the result, and based on that, do the next thing. So if we were to use that completable future, uh, this code would look like that. Uh, this is called asynchronous programming. Sometimes it's also referred to as reactive programming. Uh, but really, it's just a style that's meant for us, that, that meant, is meant for, to allow us not to block. Now, um, wh whatever your opinions are about this style, uh, I suggest just last night I watched this very nice talk about someone who's an expert on reactive programming. Uh, he has some strong opinion on why this style is actually problematic. But let's look at some of the problems. So first of all, uh, I suppose our uh, original method was not that simple, but we actually wanted to do some control flow. We wanted to branch the result of the first compute and then loop uh, over the second call. And we simply cannot use those uh, existing Java mechanism if we use completable future. We can use different ones that are specially built sort of a DS. So th this completable future has sort of its own DSL for doing control flow. Uh, but we can't use the ones that are built into the language. So this already shows some kind of mismatch. Another problem is, what happens if we have an exception? So we use two exceptions giving us some context of where the problem happened. But when we use something like computer, Completable Future, any of the reactive frameworks like Rx, Java, et cetera, um, each of these steps can be executed in a completely different thread uh, 
and it will likely be a thread other than the one that called uh, calc important finance. And uh, the stack trace we get, get, we're going to get in the exception is not going to tell us the context we were actually running in. And this makes uh, debugging this code very hard. Not only that, it makes profiling this code hard because profiling works by sampling stack traces. And if the stack traces no longer give us the actual context of our computation, uh, they're basically useless. But perhaps the biggest problem is the return type. Like in the case of IO in, in uh, Haskell, the return type here is of this uh, strange class that wraps a double, and we can't get the double inside it unless we block, and that's what we don't want to do. So everyone who calls this also has to work with these completable future in an asynchronous style, and this is viral. It means that our entire call stack must be either synchronous and blocking or asynchronous, and it is nearly impossible to interoperate the two styles, so we get two separate worlds. So what do other languages do about that? Uh, C Sharp introduced something called async awaits. So the task class in, in C Sharp is similar to completable future in Java, uh, but now you can add this async annotation, and you can prefix calls to uh, async methods with the awaits keyword, I guess. Um, and uh, this way you get uh, a nice imperative looking code. And this certainly solves the first problem. Now we can use uh, uh, exceptions. Now we can uh, use control flow like uh, if and while, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't really solve the second problem, though, of the uh, exception uh, uh, stack trace, uh, because uh, each one of those lines will still be executed in a different thread, and uh, the exception is going to give us uh, a strange stack trace. Now, this is actually they've, uh, something they have fixed in, in .NET Core, I think, 2. Point one released last year, um, they artificially generate uh, a stack trace that does capture the actual context, but it would still be a very different stack trace from the one you'd get if you were writing ordinary blocking code. Uh, but it doesn't solve the biggest problem, and that is that you still have now two separate worlds that can't interoperate properly uh, the one, the async world and the synchronous blocking world. And the question is, why give up? So, so the, the imperative languages that we know not only handle input and non-determinism, they are, have this built-in notion of, of threads or processes and blocking, and it is a good abstraction from a programming perspective. Uh, and the only reason we, we sometimes uh, uh, want to avoid it is because the implementation by the kernel of threads is too heavyweight. So why do we want to abandon something that's not only a good abstraction, but a core abstraction of this paradigm just because of an inadequate implementation? The obvious solution, instead of changing how we program, is just to change the implementation. And that is what we're trying to do in part, as part of Project Loom. So um, to replace implementation, first we need to understand what it does. So what is a thread in a process? So if we think about it and try to decomplex it, as, as uh, uh, Rich Hickey may say, uh, we see that there are actually two different capabilities here. First, we need the ability to stop the code that's running on the CPU and say, OK, I'm not, doing, I'm not using the CPU anymore, and later on have the ability to resume it. So that's one capability. The other capability is we need some mechanism to schedule those pieces that want to run the CPU and say, OK, now you're ready because you were waiting for something else to happen, like an IO operation to complete. Now you can run on call number three. And uh, we have names for these uh, two capabilities. The first one is called continuation. So that's the ability to suspend running computation and later on resume it. And the second is just a scheduler. So as part of Project Loom, we've implemented continuations in the JVM exposed as this class here. Um, and uh, what it does, this is very similar to the one actually in the prototype. It's not quite the same, and it changes a bit. But So what we get here is we have a continuation of a certain body. That is going to be the, the code that will be able to suspend itself. And then we run it. When we run it, uh, we start executing it, and it can either run to completion or yield. In either case, run will return. So there is no concurrency here. 
everything is running on the same thread, but when you call run, the body of the continuation is going to run either to completion or until the next time it calls yield. Uh, if it calls yield, if we ask if you're done, it's going to say no. If it's terminated, it's going to say yes. Uh, this scope thing allows us to nest different continuations inside another uh, uh, and to be able to suspend uh, multiple continuations and jump back multiple callers, similar to how we throw exceptions uh, way up the stack. Uh, to be more precise, uh, if you're interested in, in the theory of continuations and in, in the academic literature, the kind of continuations this class implements are called one-shot multi-prompt delimited continuations. So I'm going to explain each of those. Uh, the delimited part means that the piece of the code that we are suspending and resuming is not the entire program, but just the code that's inside the body. So the body delimits the code that we uh, want to suspend, and uh, that's why they're delimited. Uh, Multi-prompt is uh, exactly the different scopes. The different scopes are in the literature are called prompts. Uh, we can nest different continuations and jump back to uh, suspend however many of them we want. And one shot means that uh, this continuation is mutable in the sense that every time you run it, it's going to run until the next yield point, and then its state changes. And then we, when you run it again, uh, it's going to run from the first yield point to the second, and we can never go back in time. Uh, now, continuations are a very low-level construct. Uh, application developers not to expect to use them directly. They're supposed to use uh, high-level constructs that are built on top of them. Uh, but if you were to use them directly, this is how you'd use them. So you have a continuation. That's the body. Loops forever. Prints out some stuff and occasionally yields. And then if you want to use that continuation, you just loop as long as it's not done. In this case, it's never going to be done. Uh, you run it, and every time you call run, uh, it's not going to loop forever. It's just going to execute the next iteration until you yield. Uh, the important thing here is that the call to yield does not actually need to be inside this uh, outermost uh, uh, top-level uh, uh, block. It can actually be inside some method deep in the stack. Uh, you can call foo, and foo calls bar, and bar calls yield. Um, so uh, part of the continuation state is a stack. So the continuation maintains its own stack and its own program point, uh, program counter, where it is in the program. Now, people who may be familiar with continuations in other languages like Scheme, and maybe I think there's uh, experimental implementation in OCaml, uh, might be a bit horrified to see that the return types of the run and yield methods is void. Usually, uh, you want to pass some information from run to yield. Uh, writing continuations are, are able to pass information from run to yield. On top of this, it's actually very easy. But one of the reasons we've done it this way is that normally continuations yield cooperatively or voluntary. Um, but because the return type is void, we can <coughs> sorry. <coughs> because the return type is void, uh, we can if a continuation gets into <coughs> an infinite loop, we can ask it to preempt itself and forcefully remove it from the CPU. And this being Java, and we like monitoring, and I said a, con uh, a stack is part of the continuation. We also have some methods to inspect the continuation stack. So this class implements uh, one-shot multi-prompt delimited continuations, but we could decide to add the ability to clone them. And if we clone a continuation, we can capture its state and time, and then we run it. And we get something that's called reentrant or multi-shot continuations, and this is how Simple it is to implement those on top of these one-shot continuations. Uh, we just clone the continuation every time we run it and return a new copy. And you can do some crazy stuff with this. You could um, write programs that actually go back in time. And most people have no need for it, and I'm not sure we're actually going to implement that, but we could. Uh, another more interesting thing we can do, we can make those continuations serializable. And this means that you can write a piece of computation which blocks Say you are reading uh, uh, something from the database, and you're waiting for a response. And while you're waiting, you're actually not just going to be suspended off the CPU, but entirely off the machine. And when you return and get the results from the database, you could be in a different machine altogether. 
perhaps closer to where the data is, and uh, this would make access to the data faster. So these are continuations. And I mentioned before that they are a low-level construct. Uh, and what we want to build on top of them is rebuild threads. And threads are just continuations and a scheduler. We already have uh, very good schedulers in the JDK in the form of uh, all the thread pools, like fork join pool. Uh, and we combine them to implement threads in the JDK uh, in user mode, not going to the kernel, and those are called fibers. So to remind you, why uh, do we want to do that? Uh, today, people writing applications have either the option of writing simple, synchronous blocking code, but they're relying on the kernel to provide them with threads, and the kernel can only handle so many uh, threads. So the application is going to be very clear uh, and easy to maintain and debug, but it's going to be uh, not scalable. The other option is to write asynchronous code, as I showed you, uh, which is much more complex and very hard to port existing code to, uh, but at least it's scalable. So with fibers, if we can indeed make them much more lightweight than the threads provided by the kernel, we solve this problem. You can have as many of these user mode lightweight threads as you like, and you can block blocking becomes essentially free. Uh, we can say that it codes like sync, but works like async in the sense that your code looks uh, blocking, but from the perspective of the operating system, no kernel thread is actually blocked. And all the IO behind the scenes is asynchronous, even though to your code, everything seems synchronous. And this makes writing concurrent applications easier um, because it helps you match the, your domain's unit of concurrency, say the user of the session or the income request or outgoing request to match it directly to the software unit of concurrency, which is the thread, or in this case, the fiber, the, the lightweight thread. Uh, and this is something you can't do with heavyweight kernel threads because you may have uh, 100,000 concurrent uh, requests, but you can't have 100,000 concurrent, uh, concurrent, uh, uh, 100, concurrent users, but you can't have 100,000 concurrent threads. Um, but with fibers, you can. So this already makes writing uh, code easier. Now that we have the scheduler and we have the continuations, we have fibers, uh, but now we have to find all the places in the JDK that potentially block and teach them about this new mechanism. Uh, so what kind of things block? So of course we talked about IO. So we've gone into all the places in the JDK that do IO and taught them about fibers. The other case where you can block is uh, with synchronization constructs like clocks or blocking queues, channels, whatever. Uh, those are all classes in Java till concurrent, and we've done the same there. Uh, just to see an example of how. So all of the classes in Java till concurrent that block uh, traditionally just uh, called unsafe. Uh, so uh, all, when they want to block or unblock a different thread, um, they all go through this class called block support. And what lock support used to do is just called unsafe.park. Unsafe.park is a call to the, uh, to the kernel, please park this current thread. And if you want to uh, unblock a different thread, you call unsafe and unpark, uh, and then ask the kernel uh, to uh, unblock that thread. With fibers, we have an option. So first we ask to see if we are existing old heavyweight threads, and if we are, we do it the old way. But if the current abstract thread we're running on, which you call it a strand, so a strand is either a fiber or a heavyweight thread, uh, if we want to park, Parking is just yielding the fibers continuation. So every fiber has a continuation. Uh, if we want to unpark, all we have to do is to find the, that fiber scheduler and that fibers continuation and submit the fibers continuation to the fibers scheduler. And that, that continuation just appears to be an ordinary runnable, an, order, an ordinary task for that scheduler. And the next time that scheduler is just going to run that task, in effect, it's going to continue your code from where it last left off. And if you love async await so much, this would be the entire implementation of async await on top of this. So this is strictly stronger than async await. But of course, all this would be worthwhile only if we could do better than the operating system. We need to do better on two counts uh, if we want to support that many uh, lightweight threads, that many fibers. Uh, so on the left hand, we have some uh, data about uh, old uh, heavyweight threads in the JDK. Uh, they each have about two kilobytes of metadata plus, by default, one megabyte of stack. Uh, 
When it comes to fibers, they currently have, in the prototype, they currently have only two to 300 bytes of metadata, and uh, the stack is pay as you go. Uh, it can grow and shrink however much you use. Uh, when it comes to task switching costs, for heavyweight threads uh, managed by the kernel, the time to switch tasks is between one and 10 microseconds. For fibers, we don't know how much that is, and that uh, performance is something uh, we're still very much working on, but uh, we expect it to be much lower than that. Okay, so threads, uh, fibers are just a user, user mode implementation of threads. So we thought uh, we could use the same thread API, maybe with a new constructor flag saying uh, whether when you create a new uh, thread in Java, whether you want it to be uh, managed by the kernel or by uh, the JDK. Uh, but in Java, we uh, try to think ahead. Java is already big, it's been around for uh, over two decades, and will probably be big in two decades hence. So uh, when we touch concurrency in Java and threading in Java, this is an opportunity to rethink things. So the Java architect said, yeah, maybe we'll use the same uh, thread API, but let's not assume that that's what we're going to do. Uh, try to think that if there was no baggage of threads, no existing API, how would you uh, design them? And at first I thought, there's not much to do. I mean, after all, what kind of operation you want from a thread? You want to start it, you want to wait for it to join it, maybe you want to ask it to interrupt whatever it is that it's doing. But shortly after we had this conversation with the architect, I read a very interesting blog post uh, by Nathaniel J. Smith about something called structured concurrency. Now he credits the idea uh, to uh, Martin Sustrick, and this was one of the rare occasions when you read a blog post and you say, that is absolutely right. Uh, that is the way to do things. So what is the, the, the main idea of structured concurrency, the central, the, 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 the central trick there, is that instead of creating threads uh, in a way that's like fire and forget, so you create a thread and that thread runs for as long as it wants and you have no control over it, uh, threads are confined to a well-known lifetime that extends to a given code block. And I'll show you an example. So in uh, the current prototype, for lack of a better name, we just call it Fiberscope. Uh, the name will probably change. So we have this block that defines a Fiberscope. And all the fibers that are created inside this scope are guaranteed to be terminated by the time we exit the scope. So how does that work? When we try to exit that scope, in Java it's a try of resources, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna automatically call the close method on fiber scope, and that's going to block until all the fibers that were created inside the block have terminated. Um, and uh, this gives us some uh, uh, nice advantages. For example, when you create a thread and you just forget about it, uh, there could be exceptions that are thrown by that thread, and no one is ever going to handle. Uh, this way, because you know that the thread is going to be born there and die before the end of the block, uh, you can catch its exceptions and handle it. And uh, you can create a great many number of fibers, and you can even nest these scopes to create a tree of uh, fibers, and you can cancel all of them by just canceling the scope. Um, so some nice stuff you can do with it. Uh, you can write a method that gets an array of tasks and wants to uh, start them all in parallel, but only wait for the, it's, it's like a race. They, you only want to wait for the first time that finishes. So fiber scopes give us termination queues, and for each of the tasks, we uh, spawn a new fiber. Again, that's essentially free. It's just like creating an object in Java. Um, and we assign them that, uh, to the termination queue, and then we block on that queue, <clears throat> and we take the first the result of the first fiber that has terminated. Uh, and because we cannot leave the scope until all the others have terminated, as soon as we have a result, then the finally block, we cancel all the remaining fibers. And then we can leave the scope. Uh, we can do the exact same thing, but just changing a little bit. Instead of saying that the fiber scope is cancelable, we can give it a deadline and say that we are only willing to wait up until that deadline for any of the threads. So if one of the threads finishes by that deadline, uh, then we're good. If not, then the fiber scope is going to automatically cancel all of them. And this uh, allows us writing interesting things. Um, 
in a very nice way. Finally, there are other, so the, by far the biggest use case that we currently envision for continuations are for fibers. We expect people to use fibers, not continuations directly. Uh, but there are other things that you can do with continuations, not as uh, useful perhaps as, as uh, fibers, but interesting nonetheless. One of them is generators. Um, and you may be familiar with them from Python. Uh, this is how you'd implement generators. There's a bug here, but generally, this is how you'd implement uh, generators uh, using continuations, just to show you how, how easy it is. And what this gives us is the following. Uh, we want to imagine that we have uh, an infinite uh, array, or an, infinite iter or an infinite collection of the Fibonacci sequence, and we want to iter iterate over it until we get to some look at the bottom, until we get to a number that's greater than 10,000. Um, we can use streams for that, but uh, in this way, we get uh, an iterable, something that looks like a collection, but notice how we generate it. We generate it in an imperative way. So first, we yield zero. And we go back. So once we yield, you go back to the call there, and that zero is going to get into num. Then we start an infinite loop, and uh, we keep yielding numbers, one after another. And every time we yield a number, we leave that piece of code, we go back, and we can write iterators in a very nice way. The last thing I want to show you is how these continuations compose. And in fact, they compose much better than monads. Uh, because they can nest, and they have these scopes. So uh, this example doesn't really make sense, but uh, entertain me. Uh, this time, we want to generate the stream of prime numbers combined with some user input. Uh, we want to uh, find the next prime number uh, and then read a line from the console and uh, concatenate it with the number we found. And we're doing a blocking operation inside the generator. Now, what happens if we run it inside a fiber? So right now, we have two nested continuations. We have the continuation for the generator. And every time we yield the generator, it's going to go back into the for loop. But every time we go to the console and, and, and uh, read a line from the user, that is going to suspend the fiber's continuation and a closing scope. And we can, in this way, compose uh, different kinds of effects, sometimes they're called. Uh, different kinds of effects in a transparent way. And so this project is still under heavy development. Um, you can uh, find the wiki page here. Uh, you can, uh, we don't have early access binaries yet, but you can build the code yourself. Uh, and right now, I'm mostly interested in input on the structured currency API. So any help you can provide on that would be appreciated. And that is all I had. So thank you. Any questions? So any questions? They're in the back, I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, how does that differ or overlap with uh, Kotlin's coroutines? Looks quite similar to me. So the coroutines are another name. <laughs> OK, so the nomenclature here in the world of continuation is a problem. Um, at least in the past, uh, coroutines are sometimes a different name for one-shot delimited continuations. Uh, it's just that uh, the name coroutines is now, is now mostly associated with uh, usages of continuations that have some syntactic expression, something like async await, that at the syntax level, you say, this piece of code is a continuation. And we don't do that here. Any method is allowed to uh, yield a continuation. Uh, there's another different kind of continuations, um, symmetric and, and asymmetric. And uh, coroutines at the time used to refer to symmetric continuations. These are asymmetric continuations. But basically, different names are the same basic idea. We often see um, continuations and tail calls uh, talked about together for you know, CPS transform and so on. So are there any plans to add tail calls, the wonderful missing pieces of the puzzle, into um, Java? Uh, 
Right. So, so, so let me just correct that. Any time, plans to add them within my lifetime? So I know there have been plans to add them forever. <laughs> right. So, so uh, we don't actually need tail calls to implement uh, these continuations. However, uh, actually, Project Loom, the, the, uh, the goal of the project is to add continuations, fibers, and tail call elimination. Uh, so this is one of the goals of the project. It's just that we haven't started it yet, and we're probably not going to start it until continuations are released. Uh, so that's going to be a next step. Uh, so I just don't like talking about it so people start expecting it. Um, but yeah, that is one of the, uh, of the goals of the project. Uh, wait you? first, you. Yeah. Yeah. Are you aware of any projects in Python that would uh, add continuations? Uh, so Python has generators, which are a form of continuations, uh, but on that, I'm not that familiar with Python. Do you envisage Project Loom being released one big bang in one release, or are you going to be releasing the different kind of uh, goals in different releases of Java? Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, I've been asked if we were willing to release continu continuations before we release fibers. The answer to that is absolutely no, because continuations are a very low-level construct. And once we release continuations, there are going to be 100 fiber libraries built on top of that. And uh, first, we want people to get used to one. However, it is possible that we will release fibers before we open continuations as a public class. Uh, we will likely release something before we do uh, tail calls, for example. Uh, so it would probably be multiple chunks. Uh, I'm not sure what those chunks are, but basic functionality for uh, fibers is probably going to be in, in the first release. Andrea? Here, okay. I think he was first. So you mentioned that you have a use-as-you-go memory footprint. Does that mean that you have to load the executed stack to continue executing because you can't continue calling forward? It's like, how does that work? Right, so I can speak, and, and you can watch other talks while I speak about the implementation for an hour. Um, the, stack, the continuation stacks are stored in the Java heap inside two Java arrays, uh, and we do copy them back and forth uh, the question is how to do it fast. And uh, right now we have a solution that allows us to copy just one frame uh, and the rest lazily. Uh, we can talk about this later or we can watch another talk where we talk about the implementation. Um, I think uh, introducing continuations in Java uh, opens the gate to memory leaks, another gate. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are any patterns that we can stick to to avoid memory leaks. Like, fi are fibers one of them? So I think you're referring to memory leaks in the sense that you can have a piece of code that starts executing, holds on to some object, and never terminates. Uh, so we do have this problem today already with threads. You can create a thread that at some point either loops forever or sleeps forever while still holding on to some stuff. Um, but this problem could be exacerbated if you can have a million threads instead of just a 1,000. Um, right now, we're not thinking, again, uh, uh, application developers are not supposed to use continuations directly, they're supposed to use fibers. You have the same problem with fibers as with threads in that regard, um, possibly more. Uh, we don't have a good solution to what happens if this problem is, is exacerbated, but if you have any ideas, I'll be happy to hear them. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, when it comes to the garbage collector, this is actually easier for the garbage collector because if you have a thread, all the, um, all the uh, objects that are referenced by that thread are uh, considered as GC roots. And GC roots need to be traversed uh, during stop the world pauses. And they can actually increase your pause the world time. Uh, continuations are not GC roots, so the GC just can't, if they don't change, as long as they don't run, the GC doesn't look at them. So it doesn't solve the memory leak problem, but at least they don't introduce an additional burden on the garbage collection. We have time for one or two more questions. Or none. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Susaku.